Welcome back to the Sunny Berkshires. Great to have you back again. And thank you all for your comments and uh, uh, stuff you've uh, sent me. People have come up with articles and uh, very interesting things. I thank you for all of it. Keep it up. Um, last week, we began to examine the phenomenon of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, that colossus who dominated the American landscape uh, for 12 of our most trying years uh, from his inauguration in 1933 to his death in 1944. Uh, and we explored the question of what in fact uh, he cured, if anything. We concluded basically he did not cure the economic depression, but what did begin to happen from the very outset uh, was an uplift in the spirit of the nation. Uh, an anything can be done spirit uh, pervaded the heretofore gloomy halls of the federal buildings. Uh, Rexford Tugwell called it a renaissance spring. FDR would try anything, just do anything, uh, was the clarion call of the administration. Uh, a welcome contrast and relief uh, from the moribund final years of the Hoover administration. And he discovered uh, and mastered the medium of the radio. Uh, and through that medium, he connected, uh, and he connected, as we saw, over great cultural divides. Now today, I'm going to go into something else. I'm going to explore the many faces of Roosevelt. And another question. Uh, given the dire straits of our country uh, when uh, uh, he took office and the calls of numerous sources uh, for a dictatorship, why didn't he cross the line to despotism? Uh, he undoubtedly could have at that critical juncture in our history. Uh, and I'm going to explore this question through the prism of an unusual enigmatic film uh, that premiered just as FDR was being inaugurated in 1933. You know, when Roosevelt had begun the uh, New Deal uh, policies, uh, someone approached him and said, you know, Franklin, uh, if this works, you're going to go down as the greatest president in the history of the United States. If it doesn't go down, uh, you may go down as the worst president in the history of the United States. Roosevelt corrected him and said, no, if this doesn't work, I may go down as the last president of the United States. Many faces of Roosevelt, Gabriel over the White House. There are many legends uh, about the Archangel Gabriel. Um, myths have it that Gabriel is the angel of truth, sits on the left hand of God, uh, messenger of good tidings, uh, that his name means governor or power, uh, and that he destroyed Sodom and buried Moses. There's something of all of this in uh, a strangely prescient film called Gabriel Over the White House, starring Walter Houston. You remember him. Uh, it was produced by, of all people, William Randolph Hearst in 1932, and it uh, premiered uh, just as Roosevelt was inaugurated in March of 1933, just two months after Hitler uh, was sworn in as chancellor in Germany in January of 33. The film is a bizarre amalgam of New Deal and fascism, and it's uh, quite frankly as chilling as it is illuminating. Uh, what uh, the different uh, uh, paths of Roosevelt and uh, uh, Hitler took speaks volumes uh, about the two men, uh, volumes about our two uh, uh, countries. But this unique script also helps illuminate the many facets of FDR's personality. So here's the story of the film. President Judson Hammond, uh, played by Walter Houston, uh, is a rank opportunist and a uh, candidate of corrupt interests, the worst sort. Um, He's uncaring, he's arrogant, uh, and uh, he's contemptuous of the common man, whom he regards as a rube. Uh, but he is a consummate actor, and he has mastered the medium of radio. Uh, he is, in short, a great communicator, but a false one. He confides in uh, worrisome tones to an aide, you know, when I think of all the promises I had to make to the people to be elected, oh, don't worry about it, the aide responds. By the time they realize you're not keeping them, your term will be over. Of course, uh, some things never change. <laughs> Hammond's a public response to the seemingly endless calls uh, for uh, uh, 
things during the Depression, for him to do things uh, during this endless abyss, is to become a patriotic cheerleader. Uh, think of the Argonne, uh, rally to the spirit of Gettysburg, uh, uh, Valley Forge, uh, but nothing happens. America, he says, will rise again, but he does nothing. Uh, the unemployed march on Washington, as they did during the Hoover administration. Hammond is indifferent to their plight and to the rampant lawlessness and racketeering infesting the nation. And then the epiphany. Uh, Hammond drives his sports car 100 miles an hour down a country road. There's a blowout. He veers off the road into a, into a ditch, uh, and he is uh, knocked unconscious. The um, archangel Gabriel, at this point, enters uh, because uh, Hammond is in a coma. Eventually, he arises from the coma, wakes up, uh, and as he does so, fully regaining consciousness, one million unemployed are now uh, marching on Washington. Their leaders are being uh, shot by uh, unrestrained, underwilled thugs. Hammond's cabinet suggests of calling out the army. Uh, sound familiar? Uh, to quell this menacing army of the unemployed. Hammond uh, says no, uh, orders his war secretary uh, to provide food for the marchers, just as Roosevelt did, of course, uh, and then invites the leaders of the unemployed to come to Washington, goes out among them himself, unafraid, and offers them jobs uh, in an army of construction without profit, which uh, many of them accept, and the, uh, the problem is alleviated. What follows then is a bizarre fusion of New Deal and fascism. Uh, Hammond fires his cabinet of uh, corrupt toadies to a man. He is now the people's hero. Uh, and he goes before Congress and forces them to grant him dictatorial powers, uh, declaring that dictatorship will be based on the uh, ideals of Jeffersonian democracy, greatest good for the greatest number. When Congress succumbs uh, at that point, a liberal's wish is enacted all at once. Now, what is Ham Hammond an act? Think of this. Now, this is now March of 33, before Roosevelt is in power. Well, he enacts uh, um, a, uh, an act stopping all mortgage foreclosures, uh, a moratorium. Roosevelt did that. Uh, and creates an army of construction uh, without profit. Roosevelt uh, obviously uh, uh, did the uh, CCC, brought about the CCC, and eventually the WPA. Uh, he uh, in, employs a banking act. Uh, Roosevelt used uh, the Emergency Banking Relief Act. It was one of his first uh, uh, of all of his uh, acts. Uh, he also directs uh, an agricultural bill uh, to aid the farmers, not the uh, hogs as Hoover had done. Roosevelt enacted the AAA. Uh, it's amazing how these things have simultaneously really uh, uh, enacted uh, in the movie uh, provisions that Roosevelt immediately enacted uh, shortly, at, as a matter of fact, shortly after he, he got into power. And even during uh, the Second New Deal with things like the WPA and so forth. It's uncanny, really. But all of this in the Hammond scenario comes with a major cost. Because uh, Hammond simultaneously creates a national police force. And with that national police force, he deals summarily with criminals. How does he do that? He does it with kangaroo courts. Uh, he does it with kangaroo courts without the benefit of appeals. And uh, without the benefit of appeals, he takes the criminals that are tried before these kangaroo courts, takes them out, and executes them before firing squads. Well, crime stops. The streets are safe once again. The people cheer. On the international front, as, as well as on the domestic front, simplistic Hearst uh, solutions are also brought to bear. Hammond disavows the Washington Naval Treaty. That was an arms control treaty, a uh, series of them actually, uh, adopted during the late 20s and early 30s. Uh, and he demands that all foreign nations repay all their debts to the United States immediately. Uh, all of the nations involved in the First World War owed money to the United States with the exception of Finland. Uh, he then brings all of the foreign ministers of those countries uh, to Washington and treats them to a show on the presidential yacht where some airplanes uh, uh, sink uh, disposable battle, old battleships. Uh, 
uh, duly cowed, they all sign a treaty uh, uh, to save the world from war. And with all of this done in this nirvana, never, never world of William Randolph Hearst, uh, Pax Americana is established. Uh, Hammond can now die and presumably uh, go to heaven and rejoin the Abra uh, angel Gabriel. Well, what about all this? Isn't this rather remarkable? Uh, we have a situation that uh, parallels in many ways what was happening with FDR. Some of these parallels are intriguing. Both, uh, in addition to the, the uh, various uh, acts which uh, Roosevelt uh, made sure uh, were enacted, a number of other individual things uh, parallel what was happening with Roosevelt. Both Hammond and Roosevelt had a near-death experience. Uh, both had an epiphany following that near-death experience. Both were unlikely men to occupy the presidency. Uh, Hammond was from a, uh, an underworld kind of background. Roosevelt was from an Anglophilic enclave on the Hudson River. Uh, both uh, really, uh, their persona and the flurry of activity at the beginning of their administrations uh, lifted the spirits of the nation. Roosevelt did that, as did Hammond. Uh, with the mark virtually valueless in Germany, uh, Germany was desperate, uh, Hitler was, uh, was uh, sworn in, and a, uh, democratic restraints were immediately lifted. Uh, Adolf Hitler obliged, just as Hearst's Judson Hammond obliged, uh, the demand for peace and order. He, uh, FDR did not oblige by breaching the separation of powers at that point. The um, author Robert McElvain noted, quote, clearly Hearst did not speak for the American people, but the case, but the ease with which Gabriel would blend New Deal type programs with a benevolent militaristic dictatorship indicates how close the United States may have been in 1933 to far more drastic changes than those that FDR introduced. David Kennedy, Another author in his, uh, author in his uh, Pulitzer Prize winning book, Freedom from Fear, uh, traces the parallel paths of Hitler and FDR uh, most poignantly. Let me just paraphrase some of them. What Hitler did is he moved on March 27th, uh, only a couple of months after his inauguration, uh, to burn down the Reichstag. It was a Nazi trick, which he blamed on the communists, uh, and uh, issued emergency decrees resulting from that uh, virtually abolishing freedom of speech and assembly. From that point on, uh, the last election which the German people would ever have uh, before uh, liberation by the Allies in 45 uh, gave the Nazi party 44% of the vote. Uh, from that point on, uh, Hitler literally dissolved the legislature, combined executive, legislative, and judicial power together. Uh, it was almost as if Germany were acting on cue following the release of the film Gabriel in March of 1933. While well, FDR was working through the democratic process with Congress to pass the 100 Days legislation, uh, Hitler's Nazi majority in the Reichstag passed an enabling law uh, on March 23rd. The law formally placed all legislative power in Hitler's hands. He used the power quickly uh, to dissolve all trade unions, to take control of the press. He would already had enormous control over the press through uh, one of his colleagues by the name of Hugenberg. Uh, we'll learn more about him in the sixth uh, uh, session. And uh, he took control of the universities and the courts as well. Uh, then the government uh, very shortly declared the Nazis were the only legal political party. And the semblance of democracy was now at an end, uh, and Hitlerian reign of terror, as we know, descended uh, not to be uh, lifted until April, of, uh, until uh, 1945. Later, as Roosevelt, uh, who had not crossed the Hammond line, was contending with conservative dissidents such as the uh, Liberty League uh, and others, uh, Hitler didn't bother contending. He simply eliminated uh, uh, by summary arrest and summary execution of his rivals such as Ernst Röhm. No trial. Later, as Roosevelt guided the uh, Social Security and Wagner Acts through Congress, Hitler, with a totally subservient legislature and assembly and judiciary, codified his policies against the Jews in the Nuremberg Decrees, uh, signaling the beginning of the Holocaust. Uh, who then was this man, Roosevelt? Why did he not pass the Hammond Line? 
to despotism. Strange thing about him, uh, he was a man of many faces. Uh, you can't really define him, uh, neither his policies nor his persona. Both are a paradox, uh, but uh, the both defy definition. Well, let's try his policies for a minute. The incongruities in FDR's policies are so recurrent and so numerous, it's impossible to deal with them all. Let me deal with one, his so-called internationalism. Uh, we think of FDR as perhaps one of the most committed international presidents of all our leaders since Wilson, uh, but it was not always thus. FDR uh, had, of course, been part of the Wilson administration, a strong advocate of our participation in the League of Nations, which we didn't do, uh, uh, and also uh, part of a, an idea, Wilsonian idealistic uh, view of uh, foreign policy and of the world. Uh, hopefully, uh, someday, uh, international cooperation would emerge. Hopefully, under that uh, nirvana, never, never world, free trade would help this come about. Uh, but FDR took office in 1933 uh, amidst a pervasive and growing isolationist movement got even greater as he went on. And he required a durable liberal coalition. He was a master politician, but he needed a durable liberal coalition to pass all of his New Deal legislation. The coalition of necessity included progressive Republicans such as Gerald Nye of North Dakota, conservatives uh, such as George Norris of Nebraska, Bob La Follette uh, of Wisconsin, William Barr of Idaho, and Hiram Johnson of California. All of these men were staunch isolationists. A lot of people in the western part of the country tended to be, also the Midwest. So FDR for a while actually morphed into a form of isolationism, condoning legislation uh, 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 sponsored by Hiram Johnson in 1934 that would prohibit the United States from lending money to governments who were in default of their obligations to this country. At the time, it so happened uh, that included all of the former, former allied governments. Uh, in time, this precursor of the so-called neutrality legislation would come to haunt Roosevelt in his attempt to aid opponents of Adolf Hitler in the late 1930s. We'll deal with those neutrality acts and that whole problem when we deal with the relationship between Roosevelt and Churchill during the critical years of 1939 and 1940 in our sixth session. Suffice it to say that neutrality acts were passed uh, barring selling arms to belligerents, uh, lending to belligerents, and shipping to belligerents all gave Roosevelt nightmares uh, later on uh, in the 30s. And Roosevelt had to risk uh, impeachment uh, to work around those uh, at, uh, at that time. Uh, Gerald Nye chaired a special Senate committee investigating the armaments industry, an investigation inspired by isolationists and by American peace movement that eventually formed the basis for the American First uh, Committee. FDR, swimming with the tide, actually encouraged the Nye Committee at first. Uh, in his 1932 campaign for president, he had reversed his previous position as a Wilsonian and had withdrawn his support for the United Nations uh, United States participation in the League of Nations. Remember, he was in many ways a chameleon and he could shift radically and drastically and go off in different directions very quickly uh, if the situation demanded. On the economic front, for example, uh, one of his first moves in June 1933 was to undermine the scheduled London Economic Conference. Uh, abandon the gold standard, devalue the dollar, focus administration on an insular, highly nationalistic monetary policy. David Kennedy astutely points out that many New Deal measures, such as the NRA's wage pegging and price setting, which we discussed last week, the, the, the AAA's efforts to raise agricultural prices, actually depended on keeping the American economy insulated from foreign trade. FDR's support of Nye came back to haunt him later, as we know, uh, with the Neutrality Acts. We think of FDR as someone keenly aware of our military weakness, and was not always thus either. Uh, in fact, FDR had campaigned in 1932 on a platform of reducing our military, which was already severely weakened uh, during the 30s. Uh, as we approached a war situation, we had a total of 175,000 troops. He moved swiftly following his inauguration to cut the military budget. Uh, 
uh, and reduce the size of the army. Army Chief of Staff uh, General Douglas MacArthur was outraged, which leads to this story. MacArthur recalled meeting with FDR at the White House. He expressed his displeasure, uh, and in MacArthur's own words, quote, I spoke recklessly and said something to the effect that when we lost the next war and an American boy lying in the mud with an enemy bayonet through his belly and an enemy foot on his throat spat out his last curse, I wanted the name to be Roosevelt, not MacArthur. FDR, upon hearing this from MacArthur, was livid, shouted to MacArthur, he could not talk to his commander in chief this way and told him to get out of his office. MacArthur choked with emotion, hurried outside, and reportedly threw up all over the steps of the White House. <laughs> if FDR's policies, such as his internationalism, defy definition, what about, what about his persona? Does that defy definition too? To begin with, Roosevelt was a great humanitarian, but he was also an intensely cruel man in many respects. As a great humanitarian, both he and Harry Hopkins, as we have seen, uh, introduced and carried through uh, a wonderful federal uh, arts program, which thrived for quite a while, but eventually against great opposition. They suffered immense criticism for that, but stuck with it. One of his first programs was the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, uh, which was a very successful program, a very real program, uh, and restored self-respect to millions of Americans. Uh, and yet, there were immense cruelties. FDR refused to support the anti-lynching bill, allowing it to succumb to filibuster rather than jeopardize the Southern strategy. Uh, he refused to support increased immigration quotas for Jewish immigrants uh, in 1938 and 1939 and 1940, when it was still possible uh, to save hundreds of thousands of Jews uh, from uh, Germany. Uh, he kept Breckenridge Long, an, uh, a notorious anti-Semite in power uh, in the State Department. He was the man in charge of issuing visas. He simply didn't issue them, and people died. All this part of a Southern strategy. He turned mercilessly on his best political ally and friend, Winston Churchill, at both the Yalta and Tehran conferences, when it became increasingly important to play the Russian card. Uh, it was clear to him at that time that uh, Great Britain was heading toward financial disaster, was not going to be a major power in the world, but the Soviet Union was, and he turned on Churchill and played the, played the Russian card during the Tehran and Yalta conferences. But in 1937, FDR came perhaps the closest ever uh, to crossing the Hammond Line. He attacked the separation of powers. Uh, it was a bedrock of our constitutional system, uh, and in the process, he cruelly sacrificed one of his closest political allies, Senate Majority Leader Joe Robinson. Now, we have seen that um, the Supreme Court was setting aside uh, much of the New Deal legislation. Uh, they had set aside the AAA. They had set aside the NRA, as we saw last week, Mortgage Foreclosure Act was set aside, uh, and, and the, um, uh, the minimum wage law uh, in New York was set aside. So it was becoming increasingly apparent to Roosevelt that his legislation was being blocked by a Supreme Court and that this wasn't going to change. Roosevelt won an overwhelming majority of the nation in 1936 when he ran against Alf Landon. Landon uh, only won two states, uh, Vermont and Maine. Roosevelt now felt enormous power. He said uh, to uh, uh, Sam Rosenman, one of his speechwriters, you know, uh, when the Chief Justice read me the oath, Sam, and he came to the words, support the Constitution of the United States, I felt like saying yes, but it's the Constitution as I understand it, flexible enough to meet any new problems of democracy, not the kind of Constitution your court has raised up as a barrier to progress and democracy. Now, full of that power and full of himself, Roosevelt went this far. He devised a scheme to pack the Supreme Court. To pack the Supreme Court by introducing legislation which would give him the ability to replace anybody or appoint an additional person, uh, not, not take them out, but appoint an additional judge in the federal system if the judge reached the age of 70 and didn't, uh, didn't retire. 
Of course, it was aimed at the federal system, but everybody knew it was aimed directly at the Supreme Court. This would have given Roosevelt the ability to appoint six new justices to the Supreme Court and effectively to control the court. Well, this is the first time uh, that Roosevelt really made a move that could have been the beginning of a slippery slope to fascism. Remember with Hammond, it was. Basically, he abolished the court system. The court system was under his control. Executive power had now been combined with the, with, 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 with the judiciary power. And when our uh, great founders, uh, Hamilton and uh, uh, Jay and uh, Madison, uh, devised our Constitution, they basically devised it uh, on three prongs. Uh, they wanted to uh, follow monarchy uh, because in many ways a monarchy was strong, but it was also had the ability to become tyrannical. They wanted to follow uh, aristocracy, uh, but it was uh, wisdom, counsel you get from aristocracy, but also it was uh, prone to faction and conspiracy. They wanted to follow democracy uh, where you had honesty and you had uh, um, basic participation of all the people, but you also had the possibility of anarchy and chaos. Combining those three, uh, they worked on a proposition that appears in the Federalist Papers. Ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Man's propensities for justice, as uh, Reinhold Niebuhr stated uh, so, so brilliantly, makes democracy possible. His capacity for injustice makes democracy necessary. So they devised a way of checks and balances where one branch could check the other in such a way that ambition could indeed uh, counteract ambition. Roosevelt tried to break that down and the country never forgave him for it. My father never forgave him for it. My father was a staunch Roosevelt supporter as were most of the people around us. But when my father got to this point, and saw him try to breach the separation of powers. That's the slippery slope to fascism. My father actually came home one day to my amazement with a Wendell Wilkie button. In I couldn't believe it. I'd never seen such a thing. Uh, it was blatant sophistry for Roosevelt to take the position that he did. He said, you know, the reason I'm doing this is because the, uh, the justices are old. They're superannuated. They're infirm. There's a backlog and they can't handle it. Sheer sophistry. Uh, blatantly wrong, uh, contemptuous of Congress, sheer subterfuge. Nonetheless, he uh, pressed on Joe Robinson to push this legislation through. Working on Joe Robinson, knowing that Joe Robinson's lifelong dream, lifelong dream, was to be on the Supreme Court and essentially promising uh, that's where he put him. Well, poor Robinson uh, uh, fought Congress on this. Uh, constantly, it was a losing battle. Uh, and eventually, uh, he, uh, despite chest pains, uh, he soldiered on, was found dead in his apartment on the morning of July 14, 1937. Uh, much to the chagrin of his congressional leadership, Roosevelt didn't even attend his funeral. Frank Friedel, uh, a biographer of Roosevelt, uh, concluded that during the court fight and at times before, Roosevelt had treated his congressional leaders like messenger boys. This practice finally came to a crushing halt as the court packing plan was abandoned in July by the new Democratic congressional leadership after Robinson died uh, in a strong rebuff to their party leader, Roosevelt. What had happened here? What had happened here, of course, among other things, was the famous stitch in, the switch in time that saved nine. The court had turned down uh, and ruled unconstitutional the New York uh, minimum wage law. But almost immediately thereafter, uh, within weeks, uh, they ruled constitutional uh, a Washington minimum wage law which had virtually the same provisions in it. From that point on, the five to four uh, majority before had switched over to a new five to four majority. And from that point on, uh, New Deal legislation was not turned down. Roosevelt uh, no longer pressed this point uh, the matter died. But it didn't die in the minds of many people uh, who were concerned now that this man who was the great savior of the country, 
uh, in the early 30s who had lifted the psyche of the nation had the propensity uh, for, for, for dictatorship. Continuing with this paradox of his persona, uh, FDR was often honest and spoke from the heart. Uh, you know, George Burns, the comedian, once said, you know, the secret is sincerity. He had this cigar that he would publish. If, if you can fake it, you've got it made. That was George Burns. Yeah, but that wasn't Roosevelt. Roosevelt was quite real. Uh, it is impossible to explain the absolute connect of the fireside chats over the extended period of his presidency uh, as the byproduct of anything that was fake or acting. You just can't fake that long and that consistently. You've got to believe in what you're saying or the people will eventually sense it. Those of his staff who watched the fireside chat broadcast described FDR as consumed, gesturing, speaking to an imaginary friend sitting across from him in the room. He was really totally oblivious to his surroundings. I, for one, am absolutely convinced that his broadcasts were not in the least fake. Uh, I watched the connect on the receiving end, as you know. But FDR was devious, which brings me to the story of the Chicago Convention of 1940. As we've seen, there was a growing concern among the people about Roosevelt's propensity now uh, for the poss for possibly usurp uh, uh, powers of the other branches of the government. So there was no uh, groundswell of uh, support for his running for a third term. Mind you, no American president had ever run for a third term. None had ever served a third term. It was just not part of our, uh, our heritage. Not pro uh, prohibited at that time by the Constitution, but, there was, uh, but no one had ever done it before. Roosevelt, looking at the world scene uh, as 1940 approached, uh, began to look around and see who is it that can really help, uh, handle the extreme uh, increased power of the executive that he had now, now created. He also looked around at the world situation. And here something else begins to seep in to our analysis of Roosevelt. He begins, begins to see a world situation that a lot of the rest of the country is not seeing, that is not necessarily popular to consider arming this country or arming one of the belligerent. Mind you, we had these neutrality acts that prohibited and Britain was becoming more and more a belligerent and finally did become a belligerent uh, in September, on September 1 of 1939. So he saw all that and he saw that it was impossible for anybody else other than himself. Uh, certainly not Jim Farley who was then really the only man being considered other than uh, Roosevelt of course at that time. He was the uh, chairman of the Democratic Party. But he realized that the only way for him to be uh, nominated to run would be for a draft at the Chicago Convention. Well, he couldn't be seen to be looking for a draft. He couldn't be seen to be looking for the nomination. So when people asked him, well, are you going to run again? He said, no, I'm not going to run again. Uh, well, who's going to be our nominee? He said, God will take care of the nominee for the Democratic Party. Uh, that's what Roosevelt said. Well, now the convention opened up on July 15th in a cavernous uh, convention hall uh, in uh, Chicago. It was opened up by Mayor Edward Kelly, uh, who was an old Roosevelt uh, crony and a political war horse of the last hurrah generation. Now, ordinarily, a mayor of a town uh, where there's a convention uh, opens up by uh, uh, simply uh, welcoming people, uh, but not saying anything basically political in nature. Not Kelly. Kelly, after welcoming people, veered off uh, into a, uh, a diatribe about why we needed one man. One man uh, could, uh, could fill the bill, and that was FDR. Uh, it was totally about out of order, uh, but of course it was Kelly uh, and it was Chicago. Senator Alvin W. Barkley followed very soon after uh, in rapid fire succession, read a speech which FDR himself uh, had prepared advising the delegates that the president did not wish to remain in office. Upon his saying that, suddenly the loudspeaker boomed out, we want Roosevelt. 
The world wants Roosevelt. The nation wants Roosevelt. Chicago wants Roosevelt. The Democratic Party wants Roosevelt. A spontaneous demonstration erupted, uh, even though the uh, nominations had not formally begun, and the chairman was pounding the gavel, trying to stop it. Band music, shouts, flag waving, and parades. You know the scene. This continued uncontrollably, uh, despite the pounding of the gavel for the by the chairman in a futile attempt to regain order. The bottom line is that FDR was nominated shortly thereafter by a vote of 946 to 72 for Jim Farley, uh, which Jim Farley immediately uh, moved to make unanimous. It was not until some time later that an enterprising reporter discovered that the, man, uh, that, that the voice on the loudspeaker was a lone man with a microphone in the basement, hidden in the basement of the convention hall. Now, um, there was no dog Toto there to sniff him out, as in the, uh, you know, uh, Wizard of Oz. Appropriately, he was none other than Chicago's commissioner of sewers. <laughs> it was a political hack acting on the, order, on the orders of Boss Kelly. Uh, the so-called voice from the sewer would haunt Roosevelt during the remainder of his political career. Many New Deal programs uh, may have been conceived in an atmosphere of rarefied uh, idealism, but they were often far less than ideal uh, in being carried out. Uh, for example, the disbursement of money uh, was rather immense for WPA and PWA programs, but they had it, it was dispersed through local political bosses. Who were they? Well, Boss Kelly of uh, Chicago, uh, Boss Crump uh, of Memphis, Edward Crump, Frank Haig, of uh, Jersey City, boss uh, Tom Prendergast of Kansas City, uh, who was, of course, Harry Truman's political mentor. Although FDR had entered uh, politics as an avowed enemy of political bosses, uh, he had now learned to use them uh, like, uh, like uh, marionettes on a string. And New Deal programs gave ample opportunity uh, to dispense patronage. Uh, Haig, for example, uh, took 3% of all WPA paychecks uh, in Jersey City. FDR found Haig personally disgusting, but politically useful. Boss Ed Kelly uh, in Chicago allowed WPA workers uh, to be instructed in how to vote. Said Kelly, Roosevelt is my religion. Well, FDR was uh, no less disingenuous in his personal life. Uh, in the fall of 1918, of course, Eleanor uh, found a packet of personal letters from her uh, social secretary, Lucy Mercer. She found them as she was unpacking uh, FDR's luggage from a trip to Europe. Uh, she confronted him with them. Uh, there was a bitter family confrontation. Uh, she offered a divorce, uh, but Sarah uh, Delanor, Delano Roosevelt, who would have uh, supported them both, would have none of it. Uh, she threatened to cut off all financial aid uh, and eventually a rapprochement was realized. The rapprochement was that Eleanor would never again share Franklin's bed and Franklin solemnly vowed never to see Lucy again. On the surface, FDR complied with this uh, unusual and very unnatural arrangement, uh, but uh, surreptitiously he arranged for Lucy Mercer to attend all of his inaugurations, uh, saw her often in the White House later on, more particularly when Eleanor wasn't there, was off on various missions for him, and of course Lucy Mercer was alone with him uh, in Warm Springs, Georgia on April 12, 1945 when he died, a fact that Eleanor never, never got over. Stories of FDR's insensitivity at home are legion. Eleanor and Franklin were married on St. Patrick's Day in 1905. Uh, the best man at the wedding was, of course, President Theodore Roosevelt, her uncle. Uh, he became the focal point of all intention. The bride was merely a wallflower. Uh, when they got back from their honeymoon, uh, lo and behold, a great surprise, uh, a townhouse was waiting for them all ready made in New York. Only problem was that it was staffed uh, and furnished entirely by Sarah, Sarah Delano Roosevelt. Uh, and, and best of all, it opened into her townhouse next door. Uh, Eleanor was crushed. She was crestfallen. She was weeping uncontrollably. FDR 
couldn't understand why. Uh, in uh, Hyde Park, where they spent a lot of their time, uh, Sarah Delanor Roosevelt sat at the head of the table. There was no fixed place for Eleanor whatsoever. Uh, so here, paradoxically, FDR never objected to any of this kind of treatment of his wife. Paradoxically, we have a man, Roosevelt, who was sensitive to a fault, uh, to the plight of the poor, the downtrodden, and the uh, uh, underdog. Spoke to the people directly, spoke to them from the heart, connected with them, but at the same time completely insensitive to his wife's plight with his own household. So the man's an enigma. He had a harsh, cruel streak, was often insensitive and contriving, was possessed of an overriding desire for power and a tenacious reluctance to share that power, and he ascended to power at one of the most vulnerable turning points in American history. He had all the personal qualities to move in the direction of a Judson Hammond, didn't he? But he didn't go there. Why not? In an attempt to try to solve this riddle and make some sense out of the contradictory strains within FDR, I sought to discover prevailing influences in, in his life. In so doing, I probed Roosevelt's background, his roots, his upbringing, and what happened to him during his early years. And this is what I found. The earliest Roosevelt to come in this country, come to this country, was Claes Martensen von Rosenvelt. He was Dutch, he arrived from Holland in the 17th century. The name means Rosefield. And because of the spelling of his name, both friendly and anti-Semitic groups uh, often raised questions about FDR's possible Jewish roots. Said FDR, they may have been Jewish, Catholic, Protestant, uh, I really don't care in the dim distant past. What's important to me and that I'm interested in is that they were good citizens and believed in God. I hope they were both. Roosevelt clan was quite comfortable, as you know. They settled along the Hudson River. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, they really evolved into something uh, not uh, sort of akin to the landed gentry of England. Uh, and that was also the environment of Warren Delano, who uh, settled right across the river, uh, the same basic social class uh, of course, uh, Sarah Delano, uh, the daughter of Warren, met, married James Roosevelt, Roosevelt's father, but uh, he was a man 26 years her senior. He was 53 years old when Roosevelt was born, and Roosevelt was an only child. But, um, by the way, James had a child by an earlier marriage. He was a widower at the time. More important to the upbringing of FDR, uh, FDR was brought up in a sheltered, insulated environment, uh, doted upon by a mother who breastfed him until he was a year old, uh, wouldn't let him take a bath alone. She insisted on bathing him until he was eight years old. Amazing. Although uh, FDR was secure, uh, he didn't grow up as a mama's boy. Uh, Sarah deferred many things to his father, James, and as we know, he went, uh, it, uh, James took him very often around the, around the estate uh, and also uh, that gave, of course, uh, the labor uh, of, made the CCC a labor of love uh, to Roosevelt, who loved the environment. But another important thing happened. James took ill and traveled to Europe in order to take the baths at Bad Nauheim, it was supposed to be uh, helpful as a cure. And while he was at Bad Nauheim in Germany, uh, they took Roosevelt with him. Uh, they entered him in a German uh, Volksschule, uh, a school essentially uh, to help him learn German. He didn't learn a lot of German, but he did learn something else. He was forced to take a course in military geography that was uh, insisted upon in the school system by the then Kaiser. This is the same Kaiser Wilhelm uh, that uh, led Germany into the First World War. Uh, I am convinced that FDR's sensitivity to German military proclivities and propensities absorbed at a very early age when he studied at Bad Nauheim uh, had a great deal to do with his decision early in 38 uh, to aid Britain despite isolationist protestations here. He was sensitized to that. And Frank Friedel points out that until the age of 14, Roosevelt was reared in the sheltered world of the novels of Edith Wharton and Henry James. He was out of touch with the mainstream of American life. Uh, he even spoke English with a bit of a brogue, a foreign accent, and couldn't even correctly pronounce Schenectady, which was not very far from his house. 
but the inbred sense of noblesse oblige combined, combined with the manifold changes brought on when Franklin went to Groton and then on to Harvard uh, did much to shape his destiny. It was the Groton experience and the Harvard experience that I want to focus on here for a moment. But what about Groton? Uh, there he came under the influence of a man by the name of Rector Endicott Peabody. Now, he considered Peabody one of the most compelling forces in his life, and I think any understanding of Roosevelt is impossible without understanding Reverend Endicott Peabody. Now, Peabody essentially was educated in England, uh, tried to establish in the United States a kind of English academy that he had attended, uh, aimed at educating the sons of the well-to-do. Uh, the curriculum he instituted at Groton brought together a classical curriculum with a vigorous Spartan entertainment and sports. But most important of all, he sought to infuse in his boys a spirit of Christian service and to instill within them a moral vigor in the pursuit of religious uh, and civic responsibilities. The program was modeled after the Christian socialist movement in England. The Peabody inoculation took with Roosevelt. Uh, it affected him deeply. Frank Ferdell describes how Roosevelt, uh, as part of his training under Peabody, uh, would accompany one of the Groton schoolmasters, a man by the name of Reverend Sherrard Billings, on his rounds to neighboring towns where Billings preached and paid charitable visits. He joined, uh, FDR did, the Missionary Society uh, to help underprivileged boys at a summer camp near Boston. And it was one of his obligations, personal responsibilities, to care for an elderly black woman uh, one summer, bringing her provisions and food. Regions, uh, Roosevelt's religion, Friedel points out, was really quite simple. Uh, it was simple and unquestioning rather than based on complex theological argument. It was very much like Peabody's. And when he uh, got to the White House, uh, he would often call upon Peabody to conduct services in Washington. Now at Harvard, important things began to happen. FDR did not excel academically. Uh, but he began to win student elections at the various offices and became the editor of the Crimson. That's a very prestigious position. But more significant to me than all of this was his rejection by the Porcellian Club. For those of you who don't know, uh, Harvard at one time had a system of final clubs, they called them. Uh, these were exclusive clubs uh, where people ate and they slept uh, this is long before, basically, they had the house system at Harvard. Uh, but uh, Roosevelt was trying to get in to the Porcellian Club, and he was turned down. Why was he turned down? Because his half-nephew, actually the grandson of his father uh, by a previous marriage, that uh, man had scandalously run off and married a dance hall girl, a girl from the Tenderloin, the infamous Tenderloin district. That was enough to kibosh Roosevelt from the Porcellian Club. He never got over it. I would never have appreciated the intensity of this rejection had it not been uh, for uh, my encounter, very memorable encounter, with Alfred Benish. Uh, it happened in Cleveland, it happened in 1947, and it happened in this way. In 1947, uh, I was going to apply uh, to Harvard. I was applying to Harvard and I needed a recommendation. I badly needed a recommendation. I didn't know who to go to. I very tremulously approached Alfred Benish. Alfred Benish was a man originally from very modest circumstances, but at that time uh, he was denominated by the Cleveland Plain Dealer as Mr. Cleveland. Uh, he was head of the city club, he was president of the Board of, Edu Board of Education, and he was the founder of a very prestigious law firm called Benish Friedlander. It, in fact, still is a very prestigious law firm to this day. So I very nervously approached his office, uh, opened the door, went in, and he shouted out, what do you expect to find when you get to Harvard? I said, oh, God, I, I don't know. I said something inconsequential. I was nervous as can be. But thank goodness it was a rhetorical question. Well, let me tell you what happened uh, when I was there. He said, I was class of 1901, had to work my way through uh, by tutoring. Tutored only one man, uh, a Harvard man, but it was uh, hard work. Uh, he wasn't too swift, you see. And uh, my job was just to get him through. And I succeeded. He graduated. 
uh, and I was paid well, but it was damn humiliating. I said, humiliating, uh, Mr. Benish, why? He said, once I was outside this man's study, he said he didn't recognize me. I could be in the hall, I could be in the street, he wouldn't recognize me. It was amazing, but this went on for four solid years. It was humiliating, uh, but uh, uh, I suppressed my pride, I needed the money. Well, 25 years passed, and I went back from my 25th reunion to Harvard, and that's a big deal, uh, actually, when you go back and you take your family. I said, you know, I'd made my mark by that time, and I brought my wife and my children. Now, we were at a uh, picnic in Harvard Yard, and I spotted him from a distance, and I said to my wife, you see that SOB? Don't recognize him. <laughs> she said, okay. Much to my amazement, he approached me. He approached me, he said, Alfred, he said, it's been on my mind for 25 years. I'm so glad you're here. I've been trying to write you for 25 years. I've been trying to explain for 25 years why it was. But you know, I couldn't write very well. I, I could never really quite get it out. And I wanted to tell you what, why it was that this circumstance pertained for four years while I was at Harvard. You see, you've got to understand, uh, our family lived in a classic townhouse down on Beacon Hill in Boston. Uh, we associated only with 100 families and those only in New York and Boston. Uh, we were only to uh, socialize with the people at the very, very top of the social register. No one west of Boston or New York, no one who wasn't in one of those uh, 100 families. My uh, uh, family, uh, 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 my sisters, were all introduced at debutante, debutante cotillions. We lived royally with cooks, butlers, housemaids, uh, and when we ate at night, uh, uh, we wore dinner jackets. My father and I and my brothers uh, wore dinner jackets. My mother and sisters wore dinner gowns. A successful Harvard education, uh, Alfred, consisted of two things. One, graduate. Just get the diploma, didn't matter what your grades were, graduate, Harvard degree. You took care of that. The other was to get into the Porcellian Club. If you got those two, <clears throat> your life was made. You were a made man, basically. You had no problems for the rest of your life. Missed just one, and your life was ruined. Well, uh, I was in the Porcellian Club, but let me tell you something. Just to be seen with someone outside of the social class, uh, outside of the economic class, outside of that uh, uh, very narrow group, uh, could mean uh, blackball, it could mean uh, being uh, sent right out. He said, um, at least expulsion from the Porcellian was certainly possible. Alfred, you were not only from a lower economic class, you were from Cleveland, Ohio, and you were Jewish. You hit the trifecta. <laughs> to be seen with you was in instant death. Well, FDR felt the sting of the rejection by the Porcellian Club for the rest of his life, with significant consequences, as we shall see. FDR would eventually incorporate into the New Deal much of the idealism of Theodore Roosevelt, uh, TR's so-called New Nationalism, even more of the new freedom of Woodrow Wilson. But I feel that the social and political ideas that FDR brought to the White House from his upbringing uh, were the most influential in formulating policy. There was a certain Victorian puritanical social code which imposed upon the elite a Christian obligation to do good, perhaps best typified in the pedagogy of Reverend Enneket. T.H. Watkins perhaps summed it up best as follows. Crimes extravagantly tempered by political considerations, as of course they were. His instincts were superb, and in his own peripatetic fashion, he would hold firmly to his belief in the government's Solomon Compact of responsibility to the people. And then Watkins goes on with this very incisive phrase. This commitment would make Roosevelt the most mythologized president since Abraham Lincoln. Beloved and hated, castigated and defied, satisfying the need of tens of millions for a Moses and the equally profound need of some fewer millions for a Satan. What those who opposed him never fully understood, but Roosevelt himself somehow knew with instinctive certainty, was that the majority of ordinary Americans would always be with him." End quote. In assessing him, Hoover may well have coined a very apt phrase. Roosevelt, he said, was indeed a chameleon on plaid, 
He continually shifted, in one case, from political positions and one apparent political philosophy to another political philosophy. But this flexibility arose, I am certain, not only from practical political necessity, but because Roosevelt was a complex man, a man divided be two, between two worlds. James McGregor Burns, who uh, te still teaches here at Williams, concluded that FDR acquired a sense of security and self-assurance that he would uh, never lose. But being the consummate political animal, FDR had the instincts of both the lion and the fox. The analogy stems from Machiavelli, but it's an appropriate one here. Machiavelli counseled his prince that he must in imitate both animals, be shrewd as a fox uh, and brave as a lion. Be a fox to recognize traps and a lion to frighten wolves. And finally, Machiavelli concluded this. A prudent ruler ought not to keep faith, not to keep faith, when to do so is against his interest, and when the reasons which made him bind himself no longer exist. Time and again in his career, Roosevelt gave evidence of his ability to follow this advice, to shift mercurially from often to the shock and amazement of his contemporaries and of those closest to him. And as we have seen time and again, often the course he took was a cruel one. But through it all, as Burns points out, Roosevelt had absorbed a core of beliefs that never left him. And at the center of this, I feel, was a basic life-affirming image of man. It was a turn-of-the-century faith. It was an absolute abiding faith carried into the 20th century in Wilsonian reforms and international idealism. It was a faith that men can live together on the basis of certain simple traditional ethical rules the kind laid down by Endicott Peabody, that men are inherently good and those who are not can be improved by example. And finally, that the leader in our society has an obligation to lead by example and to make certain that these basic moral rules obtain in the life of our polity. Eleanor Roosevelt had often remarked that rejection by the Porcellians was a blessing because it ultimately rendered FDR more democratic. I have no doubt she was right, but I feel the ramifications of the event were far deeper than that even, far more significant to us. Many 19th century leaders and members of the class from which Roosevelt came could not make the shift to the 20th century. It was a century after all which wrought bitterness and cynicism, especially following World War I and going on to the Great Depression the rise of bestial leaders such as Hitler and Stalin, and the coming of the second global conflict. James McGregor Burns points out quite astutely that many of Roosevelt's peers were insecure and they were frightened. They clung not only to the old moralities as did Roosevelt, but also to the old methods, the old distrust of government, huddled within their Porcellian-like class barriers, just like Alfred Benish's Harvard to T. FDR did not. I am convinced that his rejection by this element of society then proved fortuitous for him and for the nation. Stroke of luck, actually. For Roosevelt was able to make the jump, which they could not. This may well be because he had not been fully accepted into the ranks of the elite, and thus not fully committed to the old ways and institutions, as someone so astutely pointed out last week, a traitor to his class. It may have been in part because of an epiphany when he contracted polio uh, and came face to face with death and overcame it. It may have been because he was drawn away from the pedestrian world of business and thrown into the hurly-burly by dynamic and challenging, ever-challenging uh, chaos and rough, tough world of New York politics. A challenge rarely if ever faced by his class peers. But whatever the reason, Roosevelt was bound to no fixed mooring. He remained flexible. He was able to shift allegiances like Machiavelli's prince, which he often did. He was far more able than his peer group to shift among the segments of the political world and make himself at home in all of them. It was a survival mechanism, but one which was anchored in his self-assurance. A self-assurance which he gained not only from his secure upbringing, as Burns points out,
but from being forced outside that group at Harvard. It was this self-assurance, this separateness, which I feel allowed the scion of a 19th century patrician clan to become the founder of modern day liberalism. It was this self-assurance and this separatism that allowed FDR to break the bonds of Bora and Nye isolationism and of the neutrality acts and to risk impeachment and perhaps worse in committing our country to the salvation of Britain. Finally, despite all of the many faces he showed and for all of the deviousness and the cruelty in both his political and his personal life and for all the political chicanery and opportunism that uh, dominated his career, I am convinced there was underlying it all a fundamental 19th century Victorian morality. It was the highly moral sense of obligation implanted by James Roosevelt, later informed by Eleanor. It was this new intensity of feeling that emerged from his bout with polio to forge from the hellfire of pain and suffering a metamorphosis of soul that defined FDR's place in nature on earth and with other human beings. There was above it all a certain inner compass that stayed on true north and prevented FDR from crossing the Judson Hammond line to despotism. It was a compass that President Judson Hammond and his puppet master William Randolph Hearst never could find. It was, after all is said and done, the Endicott Peabody compass that not even the Archangel Gabriel could bestow on a Judson Hammond White House. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of you who have uh, contributed things, uh, people that are writing me uh, uh, emails. It's just wonderful. And uh, I hope I'm able to answer uh, all your questions. Uh, let me answer one from last week before uh, you pose any others. Someone asked me whether the CCC was integrated. Uh, was there any uh, uh, class distinction? We've had that researched and found out, in point of fact, it was not integrated. Now, in the legislation setting it up, uh, it provided that there would be no discrimination. Discrimination, non-discrimination at that time, and to those folks, meant essentially that they could be segregated, uh, but uh, essentially uh, they would be uh, equal in their treatment. Uh, there were a lot of southern communities that had enormous problems with CCC uh, uh, coming to their community uh, with uh, uh, African American groups. There were African American CCC groups and there were white uh, uh, non-African American uh, CCC groups. They had a lot of problems with the African American CCC groups uh, um, functioning in the South. There was a lot of back and forth on it. At one point, uh, Roosevelt, uh, chameleon light uh, got into this situation. A handwritten note was, re uh, written, was written by Roosevelt uh, that a token number of black supervisors be appointed uh, in CCC camps located in the National Service, uh, Park Service property. He wrote that letter. Roosevelt penned the letter shortly before leaving Washington for a brief vacation in Warm Springs. Now the head of the program was a man by the name of Fechner, Robert Fechner. Fechner sat on it while Roosevelt was away and warned Harry Byrd of Virginia and Carter Glenn, uh, which led to a social uproar from several Southern congressmen. On his return, Roosevelt decided to rescind the order. That really falls in line with the chameleon that we've got here, uh, the fellow that found it necessary to veer off in different directions. Uh, so I'm glad you raised that issue. It's a very interesting issue. We had a number of people, as a matter of fact, of 506,000 people at the height of the CCC, 50,000 were African Americans. So they kept basically a ratio of really uh, uh, one to 10 uh, in, in that, tried to mimic at the time, the theory was to mimic uh, the percentage of uh, African Americans in the population, but they kept them segregated out. And that's what they did at that time. I'm glad you raised it. It's a very interesting uh, example of exactly what was going on at that time. Why? Roosevelt had a political coalition, and he tried to adhere to that po political coalition at all times. The strength of the Democratic Party uh, lay in three areas. Uh, one uh, was the uh, labor. Uh, the second was, of course, the Catholic Church. And the third was the solid South. 
the solid, the solid democratic South. All three of those were, were important to the democratic coalition, and he tried to keep all three in line. And here's a perfect example of how he was trying to deal with the situation. Uh, his failure, for example, to uh, back the Anti-Lynching Act, which we'll deal with next week when we get to Eleanor Roosevelt's uh, um, uh, role in trying to alleviate that situation. But this is Roosevelt. This is a master politician. Uh, there are a lot of cruelties involved in it. There is also a lot of chameleon-like activity. That's the nature of the man uh, at this point in the game. Any other uh, uh, questions? Because uh, there were a number of last week. Do we see any hands? The number of justices in the Supreme Court has been adjusted uh, from the very early days of the Constitution. Right. What was it that caused this particular effort to be so uh, so abhorred? So what that caused uh, this effort to be so uh, opposed was the fact that uh, it was it was quite patently obvious uh, to the public that what Roosevelt was trying to do was to create, though he aimed this at the entire federal judiciary, uh, that he was trying to create six more justices on the Supreme Court, which would have given him 15 justices on the Supreme Court and basically given him uh, the majority. So what uh, it was really a, uh, the public saw it uh, as a bald-faced uh, grab for power. What he was trying to do was to take the executive power and spread it over the judicial power. And once the judiciary and the executive are combined into one, you are on the slippery slope to fascism. It's one of the first steps, one of the most important steps, and the people resented it. Congress resented it. Uh, people understood what was going on. They did not like the fact that the Supreme Court uh, could, uh, could uh, 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 reject uh, his, uh, his uh, uh, legislation uh, that he had uh, passed. Uh, so rapidly and so easily, uh, but at the same time they were really uh, uh, horrified at the possibility that what he was trying to do was to break our separation of powers, the bedrock of the Constitution. So the answer is yeah, uh, it has been changed in the past. There has been legislation to change the number of the, uh, 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 of the justices on the court in the past, uh, but at this time this was a bald-faced grab for power People realized it for what it was. That why, that's why the opposition came as it did. Good question, though. Any other questions there? Yeah. You said that the court had switched 5-4 the other way. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate why that switch occurred? I don't know. Uh, no one's been able to uh, really dope that out. There are many, uh, there are many uh, 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 theories about it. Uh, there are many theories about it. And there were actually uh, a number of cases that came down uh, on the New York minimum wage law. Uh, the Butler case, the Moorhead case, the Topaldo case came down on that. And then very shortly thereafter uh, came a case in which, uh, in which uh, called West Coast versus Parish, dealing with basically the same minimum wage law uh, with a, uh, a day worker uh, in, uh, in Washington, and they switched completely. Uh, and very shortly thereafter, incidentally, they upheld the NLRB uh, and uh, in, in the case of uh, NLRB versus jones Laughlin, Why? No one's been able to figure that out. Were they cowed? Were they afraid? Were they afraid that if they didn't, uh, uh, that uh, there might be another uprising, that Roosevelt would continue to press this legislation through despite the absence of Joe Robinson? He was pretty strong, and he had, as a matter of fact, a tremendous majority, public majority, uh, in the 1936 election. Uh, no one's been able to prove to this day, it's an interesting question, no one's been able to prove that that, because they were cowed, they switched. All we know is there was a switch, and from that point on, uh, New Deal legislation was no longer challenged uh, as it had been. We know that to be the fact, uh, and it's probably fortunate at that point, <clears throat> because it was a terribly disruptive uh, force in the country, and probably, in my judgment, the low point in Roosevelt's career. I'm going to deal in the sixth session with uh, the evolution of Roosevelt from a master politician to a master statesman. Today I've been dealing with Roosevelt as a master politician, and I, I, I say again, I feel this uh, court-packing attempt was the low point of his career. 
uh, it went up from that point on, uh, but not necessarily in the estimation of the public. The public was still quite isolationist, still concerned about our uh, participation in another war. They didn't want it. We still had a very small army. Uh, the army were, uh, were a career people uh, and not uh, really uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, top people in society uh, went into the army. They didn't in those days. Uh, we had that situation and Roosevelt knew we had to change that, but he couldn't campaign on that basis. He campaigned on the basis that he would keep us out of war. Uh, but uh, those were the things going on at that time. So he evolved from a master politician to a master statesman, put his own career on the line, uh, put his life on the line, really, to get around the neutrality acts and to arm Britain. We'll deal with that in the sixth session. Next week, we're going to deal with a very interesting event. I'm going to deal next week with the year 1938. And I'm going to you, uh, I call it the age of anxiety. And it's, uh, the name of the uh, talk is the War of the Worlds in Metaphor. And we're going to use as a prism for that age of anxiety a, an extraordinary radio broadcast many of you may have heard of uh, by Orson Welles in 1938 that panicked the country. And I'm going to try to an analyze why it is that that was able to panic the country in the, way it, it, in the way it did, as a metaphor for what was going on in the country at the time. Uh, and we will see uh, many of the parallels in the rise of fascism and so forth that really impinged on the psyche of the nation during that year 1938. A strong leader was very necessary at that time. Fortunately, we had one. And it was during that period that Roosevelt began to really grow into a great statesman, in my judgment. Any other uh, questions from the audience here? Well, I want to thank you all. You've been terrific. And uh, enjoy. Look forward to seeing you all next week.